Okay, so let's continue. Um, those of you who remember time at school, can you remember doing funny things with your fingers and fidgeting around? What I certainly do, and what I, what I did was, I used to spin my pen on the, on the table, and after a few years, I learned how to do it in my, in my hand, but this is just one single, very small move. If you should be interested in learning how this can be made really good looking, there are some um, very old YouTube videos out there from our next speaker, um, <laughs> where, he, where he shows off like, some of his pen spinning skills. Uh, and this has totally nothing to do with the talk that we are about to witness. <laughs> so um, we're going to be hearing uh, something, a talk about tracing the flow of data through our programs. And so please welcome Lucas Domagala. Hi. Um, so. I was introduced already, but I want to talk to you guys about um, code execution as data. To prepare for this talk, I've been looking at a lot of old closer presentations, and you might find a few connections between my talk and some other talks. Maybe we'll see. Um, and let's get started. Um, I found closure. Ooh, sorry. I found Clojure a little bit too early um, in my career. It was 2012. Uh, I wrote a master thesis uh, using Clojure as a parser for stuff. Um, but there was not very many things to do with Clojure yet. There were not that many jobs. You, I think you just wrote your book like a year earlier or something. And the editor I was using was Clockwise, which was an Eclipse editor, which took like three hours to start, and could kind of maybe have a REPL. Um, so instead of doing Clojure, I just chose the first startup to get some experience, and somehow I stayed there for way too long. But it was a PHP-based job, and I was very unhappy there, mostly because you couldn't... Oh, sorry, am I in the way? <laughs> Um, you couldn't interact with your code in any real sense in other languages. I mean, it's the same in Java, it's the same in Java. Well, JavaScript is not as bad, but still. And if you're used to something like the REPL, uh, which we probably all use in, on a daily basis, you feel like you're like actually inside of your code. You can execute little functions. You don't need to write a million tests, even though we should write some more tests, probably. Um, we've been told, at least, um, today. <laughs> First time I hear of that. My boss is going to be happy. Um, <laughs> and, but we are inside it. We can just run it all the time. We don't need a huge thing. And other languages are more like, well, we need to write our tests because that's the only way I can actually execute that function. There's no, you can't just run one thing. That's not, the whole system needs to run. And since I was so annoyed with the other languages, now I'm overcompensating by tooling all the things that are possible to tool enclosure. I became one of the Calvar maintainers, at least after Pates hit me a few times. He's here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> hello. Ooh. And now we're in the dark again. That's what PHP felt like. You see my <laughs> thing there. Um, <laughs> and. I'm now writing tooling for Scarlet, where we try to bring uh, the, all the power we have in programming languages to documentation uh, writing for uh, regulatory people. And we're soon hiring again. So if you're interested in tooling stuff and using Closer as a language, uh, come talk to me at some point, or write me, or whatever. Anyway, how did we get here? So even when I was doing Clojure, you didn't really like to execute your code and to see what happened. You sprinkled print lines all over the place. It was way easier than in other languages because you could execute just a little bit. You still saw what happened. But after you were done, you had like 100 million print lines that you now needed to delete. And then there were braces around those and so on and so on. And now you're 
couldn't really find the code in between the trend lines. And then you had LEDs, which were even more problematic because now I, don't, I can't even execute the code in my thing because I don't have the data that's needed. Now I'm inlining devs everywhere and Claudio Condo is complaining because I'm trying to call something that's inlined and dev and whatever and everything is red all of a sudden. Uh, that's not great either. At some point you might think, well, there has to be a better way and then you Google a little and then you find Clojure Tools Trace or similar. Which where you can say, well, please anytime this function is called, tell me what it was called with and tell me what the result is. This is already a lot better. I still need to sprinkle some magic dust into my code that doesn't have anything to do with my domain. But at least it's not getting in the way as much. One of the problems with something like Clojure Tools Trace is that you're not getting data back, really. It's just printing the results into the command line um, where you started stuff, to, which means you can't really do anything further with it. You're just saying, well, I mean, I've been called with this, this was my result, and that's about it. At some point, you might even find something like debugs, um, which is really nice, where you can use uh, Clojure's um, reader macros to put them right in line, and they can still, hmm, they can stay in line without breaking uh, your code. You can even deploy it to production because there are versions of all those functions that just do nothing and then get compiled out during the compilation phase. Um, so you're already a step closer to like actually knowing what your program does. At some point later, I found Zaid, which is a really great tool, which does similar things to mine. Um, but it's only really accessible inside Emacs, and I'm guessing like half of you are using Emacs, the other half are using something homemade, and there's still another half because we're so many people that are using Calvar or something, and like we don't really have access to something like Said. Um, the other problem with Said was that it's not working in Clojure Script. That's sadly a pretty common thing where. A lot of tools get built for Clojure, and then you try to use them in Clojure Script, and they just don't work because it's oftentimes harder to get them to run in Clojure Script, so the library developers just don't care at some point, especially if they don't use it themselves. Um, so I thought, well, we'll see. What can we do with this situation? How's my time? It's okay. So, as I said, I've been watching a lot of Clojure presentations, and I needed some word. <laughs> <laughs> and Omnitrace is a little bit on the nose, which is the name of my library. So I had to choose something else. But Homo Iconic does really fit into this talk. What does Homo Iconic mean? It's, I wrote meme because you've all pretty much heard about it like a hundred times. It's the idea that in a Lisp, your data is your code, is your data, is your code. Um, where we are writing our data structures the same way we are writing our code. We can execute both, both produce the same thing. We can, if some, uh, something gets printed to the command line, we can just copy paste it into our code, it's still working. And the other thing that we have in the closure space is that we have interactivity. We can analyze our code because it's homo iconic. It's simple to analyze. I don't know if it's easy. <laughs> um, Vortut knows more about that one, um, but we can also inspect it during the right runtime, right? We can say, well, uh, dear REPL, please tell me which functions exist in this namespace. Even if we don't have the source code for it, we then we probably can't analyze it, but we can still ask the REPL because it knows about this. This, again, is a lot harder in the closure script part of it because all the closure stuff is gone and you're left with interesting JavaScript constructs, um, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so what do I mean by execution as data and what can we do with it? The idea is we're in a homo iconic language where we can say, well, our data is our code. But what about like the execution of our program? Can we somehow get the data about that? Can I say, well, some random function that got called, what did it get called with? How often did it get called? How long did it take? What was the result? 
and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of runtime data that I just can't really get at unless I'm throwing in other libraries and sprinkling them right into my code. It's not like they, it's not like they do it magically. You still need to then change the code that you have and then change it back. And then Judith is going to complain that I forgot to change some, to throw out some print lines. <laughs> and then I'm going to get bad comments on my PRs. Um, <laughs> so what can we do anyway? And can we give us more support for the tooling as well, where it's like, even with something like tool stress, it's like it's printing to the command line. It's nice. I can read it there. But that's all I can do. I can't ask questions about what really happened, how many times it got called. It's just like it's a string in the end. So what can you do with that? And can we somehow be nicer uh, than we currently are? I've, uh, I have an example that was used by Said. Uh, in the presentation that was shown for them, and that thing was also stolen out of closure for the true and the brave, um, because it's a nice, tight example, but still has a little bit of complexity. It's just a vending machine um, that where you can buy tacos. Um, that we're nearly there. No, we're not. We've got a big uh, demo thing going. Um, okay, cool. So, um, is this readable? Do I need to make it even bigger? It's readable? Nice. I don't know why I'm looking at the front line. <laughs> you probably can read it from here, but yeah. still. <laughs> um, cool. So we probably should remove this for now. Cool. So this is my demo namespace. And I've got an expected result that should be produced by my vending machine. I'm thinking, OK, cool. After throwing in a quarter, a dime, a nickel. I don't know why I'm using American currency, um, <laughs> but it's, it is what it is. The Americans are first, and so on. Um, <laughs> um, but still, we're throwing in a quarter, a dime, a nickel, and a penny. Um, and we're trying to buy a taco, which costs 85 cents. This should, well, 85 pennies, but still. Um, this shouldn't work, because this is not enough. And we'll see if. Uh, if that actually happens. So let's run this. We've got our demo expected. We probably should clear all the craziness I've been doing before. And then we'll see what happens. Oh no, we've got a bug. Strange. I, that's what I always say when that happens at work. We expected our hash map to be returned, but instead something else this is a little bit hard to read, so let's use one of the tools we've been told uh, so much about. We can uh, throw this ooh, to portal, if I can find portal. Here we go. This is what we got back. Apparently, we've bought a taco, even though we didn't have enough money, and even we, we even got money back, which is really nice. Uh, I want to use <laughs> I want to use that machine where I get more back than I put in and still get something. But I think my boss would be unhappy with me. So let's see what happened here. How can we debug this? Usually, I would go like when we start programming, we would go into the namespace uh, where this happened. We would go well. These are my key bindings. Um, <laughs> I would go, I would look, oh, OK, so this is calling some things. OK, where m might the bug be? Maybe I should put a print line in here, and so on and so on. But we don't want to do this. We can be a little bit smarter and say, well, we can do the same thing that Toolstress is doing. Well, there we can say, let's instrument that one function, run the whole thing again and see, well, run the whole thing again, I said, <laughs> and see uh, what the inputs and outputs of that one function call was. It's a little bit hard to read, apparently, on here. Um, let's again throw this thing to portal so we can see. This tells us, OK, we've got, we got called with these inputs, and we eh, 
we get these results back. But even this is, isn't telling us very much because that's just one function. Apparently, the bug is probably somewhere else. So let's undo this and see if we can do something better. Well, other than just tracing one function, we can probably just trace the whole namespace. That's something that tools trace could also do. And then we can run it. Well, I should reset the thing. And then, OK. Also tap this. And now we see, well, OK, it was called. But it also has some children that were called. We could now look for these and so on. Um, I want, I'm a little bit slow, apparently. So let's uh, skip the preamble and see what we can actually do. Let's tap this one, which is going to be more interesting. Here we can see the run that we just started um, with a little bit more data and without having to look at everything by hand. We can now see, and I can zoom into this, um, this is just a Vega graph uh, with the execution of our code. I've been always a little bit sad that when I run a flame graph, uh, for performance reasons, I don't really know what happened in there. It's really nice to see, oh, this thing called this thing, but I don't know what the input was. I don't know what the output was. And that, well, now I can see what the input was. I can see what the output was, which is really nice. I can see, oh, cool. This, so this press button thing apparently called this valid selection thing and this process transaction thing and so on. Here we inserted a few coins. This is apparently not very interesting. Let's click on this and the side ones are gone. Um, and we are now further into the uh, trace. We can now look at what happened in our execution, and we can always see what the results were. And if we look at this one, it's pretty easy to see that the calc coin values doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. We gave it a, the, a quarter, a dime, and a penny, and we got 1.4 bank, which is a little bit much. Um, if we now go into the code, we can see, well, what does this thing do? Well, it's pretty easy. It just takes the coin values, applies plus. What are the coin values? Oh, the penny seems to be broken. Let's just change it to what it should have been. And run the test again, and then we should be happy. OK, so is this all that we can do? Well, no. We can now build tooling on top of this information you saw. I don't have just the returns and the, the inputs. I've got a bunch of other things. I know what, what thing calls what. I know how often it was called and so on. So now I can also just not uh, the trace one namespace. I can just say, well, please run this function traced. and. You're smart enough, uh, the dear program. Please tell me, just do the thing yourself. And we're using Closure Condo and Orchard for that, where they know which functions your function calls and so on and so on. We can just instrument that. We'll run this thing, and we'll get the same thing out in this case. Um, but we can also like trace deeply into some other library that you're not familiar with. So you can now, instead of reading the code of the library, which you should probably also do, but you can just run it and see, oh, cool, this thing calls this, calls this, calls this, and now I know what it's actually doing. Now I don't, I got some high mental picture um, when I want to read uh, the, the code instead next time. The other thing that we can do, well, I mean, if the code explodes, I'm going to tell you where it is in, inside it and, and so on. I'm going to be a little bit quicker now. Um, one of the problems with such libraries is usually the data gets a bit big. If I do something like this, I've got something that gets called a thousand times and so on, it's going to be big. In this case, it's not actually going to be big because I remember the call sites of every call. And since this is one call site, I'm just going to say, well, after you've seen this 100 times, please just cut it off. You can change this value. You can change a few things around. Um, but there are a few catches that uh, the help you not explode your machine. But now we can also like build tooling into our editors for this. Instead of 
you saw I need to execute a bunch of stuff to reset workspaces, to run the thing. We, I said, I don't want to sprinkle crazy stuff into my code. Now that I'm in VS Code, I can just say, well, dear VS Code, let's execute a custom command, trace this thing, and it's going to run it and throw out the frame graph, throw the, cra flare, yeah. throw the flame graph into portal, and you're done. You don't have any crazy code inside your code. It's just going to run the function the way it's supposed to um, without any other things. You can also trace into Closure script itself. Like I said, you don't need to only trace your own things. You can trace into Closure script itself. So when we do this and look at portal, <laughs> I need to scroll all the way up. I would see somewhere. Oh, I moved into it. One second. Well, I'm a bit short of time, but you can believe me. You'll see um, that closure keep was called, that closure plus was called, and so on. Um, so it's not just your own namespaces. It's all the libraries all the way down. It's a little bit slower <laughs> when you do it um, all the way into the core, because a lot of stuff in the core gets called usually. That's why I've got those two namespaces blacklisted. You can unblacklist them. You can blacklist your own stuff that you want, don't want to trace, and so on. Um, we've got a few experimental things in there as well. Uh, you can do inner traces with debugs um, enabled, which means when I run this factorial thing, you can see in the output that I see all the little things that were called in between. The factorial function had the zero in here, it has the multiplication and so on, and we see all of these things called. I don't have visualization for that yet, um, but we do track it if we want to. It's bigger, but still. <laughs> um, and what's really nice is we've got more stuff. Let's go like this. Okay, let's evolve this thing and rerun this because I'm running out of time apparently. Um, we have one somewhere here. Ooh. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm still getting the normal graph, but I can now go into it and tell um, Portal to not use the normal Vega view. I can use a custom view that I built um, that gets uploaded into uh, the, the into Portal and. Instead, uh, the, I can now add interaction back from the visualization into my editor and into the runtime. If I hit a, the D button here, what happens is that the editor opens with the function that my mouse was on. If I hit the C button, the function execution gets put into my uh, copy-paste buffer thingy so that I can run the thing with the same inputs again, and so on. I have like a lot of instrumentation that I can do by just hitting hotkeys going over this thing. Then the other interesting thing that I built into uh, VS Code for the interaction is that we now also see the run inside uh, the VS Code tooltips. So anytime you run something that's uh, the traced, you can go into the tooltips and see what the last run was on that function. Even if you didn't call that function directly, it was called by some other thing, you see what uh, the values were that got put in and put out. Um, cool. So why does this work? Well, immutability, shared data structures, whatever. Um, it's the, the, <laughs> the data that we need to keep track of is not very big. I could, in theory, run this stuff on Java code, because it's in the GVM, and I've got the same information about it. But it's going to be huge, because I now need to copy every value that gets put in, because all the values change all the way time. And with the closure code, I can just remember the value that got put in, because it's probably not going to change. The runtime is also not that bad. With 20 times slower, you're only going to use this in development. You don't want to install this in production, but 
why would you? You don't want to trace this in production. You want to see while developing, why is code buggy? How does the new library work that I'm using? How does the library work that my colleague uh, built or whatever? Um, so yeah, like I said, Closure Condo and Orchard is providing the data for the tracing to know what thing um, calls what. We've got Portal that does the displaying. We've got Vega that does the graphing. Well, uh, I had to destroy Vega a little bit to get it to run, but still. Um, we've got Calva that now allows us to interact with this code without sprinkling stuff into it. I can just like hit a hotkey, it's going to run the way I want it to run, and I don't have any extras that I'm going to get uh, the that I'm going to get comments on for. Um, I've got debugs that can provide it, um, provide the inner traces and so on. So like the open source community and Clojure is awesome and it's building really nice stuff and we can then take it and build even nicer things on top. Well, I don't know if it's even nicer, but still. Um, we still got a few problems. Clojure script is always lagging behind a little bit. It can do most of the things I just showed, um, but it's always taking like three times as long uh, to build the same thing. Um, and we still need, we can still build a lot of stuff on the data we already have. Um, it's just taking time, and currently I'm the only one developing this, so it's uh, moving a little bit slowly, but I feel like all the hard stuff is kind of done. Now it's implementing stuff on top of the data we are already getting. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of future stuff happening. Thank you. <laughs>